This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to a special edition of Nightly Business Report. Well, you know, Groundhog's Day was a few weeks ago, Sue, but every day in the stock market this year yes. has felt like investors have been reliving a nightmare seemingly day after day. It sure does, but believe it or not, spring is coming, and that leads to thinking about your taxes or even the spring selling season for housing. It's an eventful time and it's only President's Day. Well, that's right, it is President's Day, uh, but it also happens to be a year when we elect a new president, and as Dom Chu tells us, the markets have nothing to say about it, but it may be the last thing a jittery stock market needs right now. As if the stock market didn't already have enough to deal with, one of the other big concerns for traders and investors is how to deal with the upcoming presidential election. After all, the man in the White House could have a lot of influence on how our nation's economy functions and what opportunities could arise. Those opportunities could potentially be different depending on various election outcomes, different candidates and different policy agendas. But we certainly believe that there are opportunities in any number of these political scenarios that could unfold. The market is either going to impact the election or the election is going to end up impacting the market. The market is a discounting mechanism. Now, that just means that prices today reflect anticipated future events. So, as we get closer and closer to the election, stocks could fluctuate depending on who is perceived to be getting closer to winning the presidency. I think from a trading perspective, it does matter. So, for example, if you see the Democrats starting to take the lead, you'll start to see sectors like alternative energy take off, or if it's the Republican, areas like defense stocks will do better. But I'll caution viewers that those always tend to be a buy on the rumor, sell on the news type of trade. And if you're somebody who's not going to be able to time that efficiently, it's probably better or less staying, staying away from those types of trades. There will be a lot of different views and interpretations of the election developments in the coming months. And the market's going to become a battleground for debate on which companies could benefit more or less, depending on who's president. On the other hand, though, there are investors who believe that these types of shorter term catalysts and events shouldn't have an effect on your longer term financial playbook. I don't think that top down history affects us on a great, uh, a great deal as far as how we allocate our shareholder capital between equity or debt or cash. There is no doubt that the upcoming election will generate more than its fair share of controversy and headlines. But it doesn't necessarily mean that investors should react to every detail and development unless they're prepared to watch every detail and development. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Dominic Chu. So let's talk more about the election issues the markets might be worrying over. And for that, we turn to John Harwood, who joins us from Washington. Good to see you, as always, John. You know, I think one of the things that the market is most, I guess, worried about and concerned about is the fact that the candidates that they thought were going to do well on either side of the uh, ticket aren't doing as well as some of the quote unquote outlying candidates. And that's brought a lot of, I guess, confusion into the market. Well, certainly the failure of Hillary Clinton to consolidate her position so far, the failure of Jeb Bush, Marco Rubio, those mainstream candidates who we thought were going to rise at the beginning adds to some uncertainty in the markets. But we're just at the beginning of this process. Uh, Hillary Clinton is still the favorite, and uh, perhaps uh, if uh, Bernie Sanders makes the market nervous, Hillary Clinton will calm it down a little bit if she, uh, as expected, uh, takes control of the Democratic race. Republican race is more uncertain, and you've got Donald Trump and Ted Cruz, two uh, uh, choices on the Republican side that the markets hadn't planned on. They're still in the driver's seat in this race, and uh, so we may have to live with a little bit of that uncertainty, and that may be have to be factored in as we move uh, forward during the spring. You know, John, it's early to be speculating about what sort of sectors of the economy might be affected uh, one way or another, depending on who wins the White House. But it does occur to me that, that based on what the rhetoric has been so far, that the health care sector would be one that you'd have to look at closely. Uh, on the one hand, uh, on the Democratic side, there's concern about the drug pricing issue, as also on the Republican side, I should say. But then uh, Republicans have vowed to dismantle the, the Affordable Care Act. 
Well, it is uh, going to be very difficult for them to dismantle the Affordable Care Act. We have heard that for quite some time. The Republican caucus, uh, Congress has tried to uh, uh, affect that for quite some time. Uh, but you do have both Donald Trump, the Republican frontrunner, uh, and uh, Bernie Sanders on the Democratic side and Hillary Clinton talking about making uh, pharmaceutical companies negotiate uh, drug prices with uh, government health care programs like Medicare. Uh, that's something that you certainly have to consider. You've also got to think about tax policy. Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton both want to raise taxes uh, at the top level, uh, and there's a wide variation between what they're proposing and what Republicans have proposed, which are very deep tax cuts. Uh, uh, Donald Trump proposes to take the, the top rate down to 25 uh, percent. Some other Republicans don't go that far, but Ted Cruz has a, uh, in essence, a value-added tax and a flat tax uh, on personal income. So uh, you've got uh, some potentially wide swings in how business uh, uh, income is going to be taxed and how wealthy individuals are going to be taxed. All right, John, stay with us as we bring in Ed Mills uh, to our discussion. He's senior financial policy analyst at FBR Capital Markets. Ed, welcome. I assume you've heard what uh, what John was just saying. It occurs to to all of us that uh, you know the markets, as the saying goes, they don't like uncertainty, but that's what they're going to have to deal with for the next couple of months, right? Yeah, this is the expect the unexpected election, and as you mentioned, the market does love certainty, and so kind of what the market would like is a Hillary Clinton ticket on the uh, Democratic side, and maybe a Rubio and Bush on the Republican side. Now, as was mentioned. Trump and Cruz are in the driver's seat, and Bernie Sanders is having a much tougher than expected or much stronger than expected challenge to Hillary Clinton. If it looks like we're going to have a Trump and Sanders nominee on either side, the market will not like that. That's when you, I think the market gets very nervous about this and looks to possibly the entrance into a third party candidate. For the first time in a very long time, we're hearing the words brokered convention bandied about. What do you think the market reaction would be if indeed for the first time we got uh, a brokered convention? Yeah, I think the broker convention is much more likely on the Republican side mm -hmm. because what we do see is that Trump and Cruz are doing well, and then there's this fight for that kind of quote unquote establishment lane. And most of these delegates are given out on a proportional basis. And unlike past years, most of these candidates have a lot of money, not only in their internal. Um, campaign funds, but also through super PACs to stay in much longer. And no one thinks that it's their time to get out. And so if we get to that brokered convention, that is a lot of uncertainty that the market would not like. I do think it's probably going towards a more mainstream candidate if you get to that point. But that does launch, launch the likelihood of a Trump third party run at that point. Yeah, John, that, what, what I was going to ask you uh, is to react to that, John. What would it mean if there were a brokered uh, convention on the GOP side? And what if there is a third party candidate, whether it could possibly be Mr. Trump uh, or Michael Bloomberg, who's making noises? A couple of points, Tyler. First of all, I think we have to note that the uh, primary calendar turns toward winner take all in mid March. So it will, uh, if somebody can really uh, separate from the pack, if Donald Trump can hold his lead, and the field remain divided behind him, he could start racking up delegates in, in a hurry. I still think a brokered convention is not a likely scenario. If you do get a third party, uh, it could be Trump. Uh, if uh, somebody else beats him for the Republican nomination, that would likely deliver the election to the Democratic candidate because Donald Trump would siphon off a lot of those working class voters that he's been attracting in Republican uh, contests so far. If it's Bloomberg, on the other hand, that would likely guarantee a Republican victory because Michael Bloomberg would draw some of those upscale, suburban, uh, college-educated voters who are more going to be more inclined to vote for the Democrats but might look to uh, Mike Bloomberg as a reasonable middle ground between the two. So a lot of variation in those scenarios. Uh, we do have to remember that it's very difficult for a third-party candidate mm -hmm. to get elected. They can be a spoiler. Would you like to react to that, Ed, uh, specifically the Bloomberg reference? Yeah, no, I think one of the things that you have to remember about the third party reference is that, you know, kind of the winner of the presidential election is the person who gets 270 electoral votes. We have a very complex system in terms of how you get the nomination and then how you get the presidency. One of my concerns is if there is a third party candidate is does someone feel to get that majority and does this get thrown to the House? So in some sense you could have a Donald Trump as a third party candidate 
and the Republican still wins in that scenario. Mm -hmm. It's not the assured Democratic victory in that case. I want to come back very quickly, Ed, to something we began with John talking about. That is the, the repeal, which the GOP have been talking about, of the, American, uh, the Affordable Care Act. If a Republican has the White House, Republicans probably won't lose either uh, House of Congress. They wouldn't have, uh, you know, maybe the ability to drive everything through. But is it more, is it possible that the ACA could get repealed? I think it's more possible that the ACAC would see some changes. I think you always have to look at the fact that anything that gets through the Senate needs 60 votes. There's some changes that you could do on a 51 mm -hmm. vote majority, uh, but one of the big fights, the part of the reason Republicans fought so hard against Obamacare after it was passed is that once you give someone a benefit, you're not going to just see a wholesale removal of that benefit mm -hmm. for millions of Americans. So the ACA okay. and most of those benefits are set regardless of who wins here. All right, John Harwood, thanks very much. Ed Mills with FBR Capital Markets. We appreciate your time. Thank you. It is that time of year again. It's tax season, but we will get you ready with everything you need to know coming up next. Today is February 15th. Normally, we would be exactly two months from the day our taxes are due. But if you didn't figure it out from our last segment, this is not a normal year. Since 2016 is a leap year, everyone gets one extra day, February 29th. But wait, there's more. This year, Friday, April 15th, is a legal holiday in our nation's capital, the 154th anniversary of when President Lincoln signed the Compensated Emancipation Act, which freed 3,000 slaves in the District of Columbia. That pushes the tax deadline for most of us to the next business day, or Monday the 18th. But... If you live in Maine or Massachusetts, the 18th is Patriots Day. So residents of those states get until the 19th. Got all that? We're going to have a quiz later in the show. My head is spinning, or I'm going to move to Massachusetts. All right, since it's tax season, the inspector general for the IRS is now warning taxpayers of a new and costly scam. And our Eamon Javers has the details. The IRS is calling me? Is this for real? Fraud is real. A new series of public service announcements is warning Americans of an age-old tax scam that's taking more and more new victims to the cleaners. In the scam, criminals call American taxpayers pretending to be IRS agents and demand phony back taxes. Often the criminals threaten to call the police if the taxpayer hangs up the phone. It makes me angry because I feel, first of all, bad for the victims. And then I, I feel angry that these criminals are using the IRS as a means to scare people into paying them money. The inspector general for the IRS says as many as 5,000 victims have paid as much as $26.5 million to the scam artists who can be located inside the United States or around the world. The scam began by targeting new immigrants to the United States and threatening deportation and other penalties. But the inspector general says it has since mutated and now is targeting every demographic group. Early in the scam, the callers had some sort of information about you. They may have four digits of your social security number. Now they're just randomly making blanket calls. And they've also shifted now to also calling cell phones. That's why the agency has released five new videos in both English and Spanish telling people that the IRS will not call you out of the blue and threaten to arrest you. And the government has one piece of advice for anyone getting such a call. Hang up on fraud. You can't be tricked into giving personal information if you hang up the phone, and you certainly can't be tricked into paying them money, harassed or intimidated into paying them something if you simply just hang up the phone. But what if the caller really was from the U.S. government? Well, the inspector general says not to worry. The IRS won't be offended if you hang up on them. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Eamon Javers in Washington. Diane Lasseus joins us now to talk more about what you need to know during this tax season, from avoiding scams and surprises to what's new as you prepare to file your taxes. She is president of Lasseus Worley, a wealth management firm. Always good to see you, Diane. Welcome back. 
Thank you, Sue. It's great to be back. I know you, you would agree with the just hang up the phone, certainly. Um, but what else can people do to protect themselves from scams? Bottom line is file your tax return as early as you can file it and avoid all those people trying to file for you. That's one. Also, not only hanging up the phone if the IRS says they're calling, but also emails. Don't click on those links when the IRS sends you an email and says, click on this link, we need extra information to process your return. Make sure you don't click on those links. They're just trying to steal your information. Let's talk, uh, Diane, if we might, about what's new this year. Are there any things uh, that are different in the filing season this time around? Not super different, but there are extensions that are really important and now permanent. One is the IRA distribution to a charity. That's a wonderful opportunity if, if you have to take required minimum distributions at 70 and a half and you want to give it to your charity, you can do that now tax-free and it applies to your required minimum distribution. The other is to the um, state and local deduction sales for taxes, state right? and local. Thank you. Uh, exactly. And there are states that don't have state income taxes, and it makes perfect sense to keep track of those sales taxes in states like Florida and Texas that don't have a state income tax. It can be a really good tax benefit. Mm -hmm. That's now a permanent. And also, in, you were saying that basically six digits issued by the IRS and, and pins, that there are pins that they are going to be um, either allocating or asking you to use when you, when you file. The IRS has started doing that as a trial in several states, and now they're, they're trying to use them for people whose identity has been stolen so that they can try to add an extra layer of protection. Some states are trying to do things like that also and include uh, a request for your driver's license to file for e-filing in, in your tax return. Right. So a lot of the, the government entities are trying to provide extra layers of protection for us. All right. On that good note, thank you so much, Diane. Diane Lasus with Lasus Worley. It's also a tax time not just for individuals but for businesses and while most traditional businesses do have established plans for paying their taxes, the fledgling marijuana industry is feeling its way around the process and as Jane Wells tells us, it could be a taxing issue for some entrepreneurs. It's tax time in the cannabis industry and for many new in the business, their IRS bill could leave them dazed and confused. Companies in our business are paying anywhere from 40, 50, 60, 70 percent, depending on what demographic they happen to be in. Even though marijuana is illegal at the federal level, the IRS still insists these companies pay income taxes. At the same time, the agency bars them from making most normal business deductions. You know, you could end up with a, a tax bill far more than, um, you know, any potential profit you could ever make. Jeremy Carr owns a dispensary in West Hollywood and said that could start to happen as legalization is bringing down prices and margins. I've seen the, the profit margins drop about 40 percent in the last five years. Here's the irony. The IRS does allow deductions for the costs of growing marijuana, but it does not allow deductions for the retail costs of selling it. Things like rent, advertising, payroll. You know, fortunately, the margins are there, at least in Northern California, where we operate. Derek Peterson left Wall Street to start TerraTech, a publicly traded holding company which owns a variety of cannabis companies, including the Bloom Dispensary in Oakland. But TerraTech also owns other companies which don't directly involve pot, like one which provides growing equipment or a firm which sells regular produce to retailers. He makes sure businesses are segregated in their tax reporting and puts as many costs as legally possible into areas where deductions are allowed. A lot of the business still is one leg in the black market. We're not able to do that because we're a publicly traded company and everything is, everything's audited on an annual basis. But there's a lot of providers out there that are, because of this headwind, are still operating with one foot in the black market, one foot in the more overt and regulated market. Those trying to be legit accuse the IRS of hypocrisy. Tim Cullen owns the Colorado Harvest Company in Denver, which did about $10 million in sales in 2015. 
He says the lack of normal deductions will cost him a million and a half dollars more in taxes. If we're licensed and legal in Colorado, that should be good enough for the IRS, but they certainly cash our checks every month. For Nightly Business Report, Jane Wells, Los Angeles. And coming up, why February is the start of spring. Well, at least when it comes to houses. We'll explain. U.S. markets were closed today, but here's what to watch this week. On Wednesday, we get minutes from last month's Federal Reserve meeting. Investors will focus on what the committee had to say about the economy and the future of interest rates. With oil such a focus of investors, Thursday's inventory numbers could trigger a big reaction in the market. And we get a look at the inflation picture Friday when the consumer price index comes out. And that is some of what to watch this week. Believe it or not, President's Day weekend marks the start of the spring housing market, or at least according to most real estate agents. Buyers and sellers alike are facing kind of a mixed bag. High prices, low supply, and a growing conundrum over the best strategy. Do you buy or do you rent? Diana Olick explains. On a snowy Tuesday in a suburb north of D.C., Jesse and Mike Shuley tried to get a jump on the spring housing market. A one-week jump, at least. I feel like there's not a lot of inventory right now, so that does make us a little bit nervous because we think there's going to be a lot more offered maybe in two or three weeks. Um, so I'd say for sure we feel that stress. Great. The Shuleys are relocating from Hong Kong, so in two days they toured 19 homes. This one wasn't even listed yet, but the agent convinced the sellers to show it anyway. This does a whole house. I think inventory is going to remain tight. So I think the closer you are to urban centers, the tighter the inventory because the demand is strong and a lot of that stuff gets scooped up before it ever hits the market. There's another media room. Prices are still going up here and across the nation, not because incomes are rising, but because demand is strong and supply is just so tight. It begs the question, why not rent? We do want to have that as an option. If we can't find something that we love, we don't want to be locked into a house and three or four months down the road decide we, we made a bad, a bad decision. Of course, rents are rising as well, so does it make better financial sense to buy or rent? As with everything else in real estate, that depends on location. Nationally, home buyers can break even, that is, spend as much to own as to rent, in less than two years, according to Zillow. That factors in mortgage rates, down payments, and taxes. In pricey D.C., it will take much longer, four and a half years. But in Dallas, just over one year. Of course, some still have that old-fashioned notion that a home can make them money. I like to buy, I like to hold, and, and not only view it as, as my home, but as a potential investment opportunity going forward. So I'm more of a buyer than, than a renter. Pretty open space. With mortgage rates falling to near record lows, the math on buying is making more sense. The craftsmanship is, is spectacular. Yeah. That is, if what little is out there fits the bill. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Diana Olick in Washington. Nella Richardson joins us now to talk more about the upcoming spring selling season. She's the chief economist at Redfin. Nella, good to, to see you. Why is there so little inventory in so many markets? Well, it, it's a combination of a, three real big factors. One, there's been a lack of new construction that would keep up with population increases. New construction of single mm -hmm. family and apartments are down 50% from where they were in their, in their peak. Second, as was highlighted, there's a lot of demand out there. Mortgage rates are really, really low, and a lot of people want to buy now. And third, there's this idea that not only can I own, I can rent my home. And so what a lot of homeowners have done when they traded up or moved up is they've rented their previous home while buying the new one, and that takes supply off the market. Finally, we're also, in addition to those three, seeing people stay in their home longer, uh, renovating instead of relocating. Mm -hmm. You know, you also say there is some good news in this scenario, for the buyers anyway, because of the seller's pricing strategy. There's been a shift in that. 
Right. Redfin recently did a survey of sellers, and we found that more sellers are pricing in the middle of the comparables in their neighborhood. That's a shift from what we saw in the fall when more sellers were t uh, pricing at the top or high end of those comparables. So sellers are getting the message that buyers are not going to pay top dollar for much longer on anything, and they have to price realistically, mm -hmm. even though there's a shortage in the market. If I'm going to sell this spring, what can I do? What little things can I I do to get my house ready for sale so that I can put my best door forward? For hmm. what well, the most important thing you can do is price right. We know that you get more views in the first two weeks of a listing than any time after. So homes that are overpriced, they miss that initial opportunity to make a great first impression. But beyond that, it's really simple things. Clear out the clutter, make sure that your home can pass inspection, that's really important, and just uh, make sure you're working with someone who knows their local market because every market is different. And you know, with, with winter still here, even though this marks the start of the spring selling season, I think a lot of people who want to sell their home, they wait until the weather turns. They wait until April or May. Is that too long? It's too long. In fact, there is demand in the market now. We know that. We measure demand by how many people go on tours, how many people attend open houses. If you really want to get the jump on competition as a seller, you need to start uh, marketing your home now while there's very little competition, especially if you're going to then turn around and buy a new home. You want to make sure your sale is in the works, and that way that frees you up to look for that next level home if you need equity in that home to purchase your new home. Nella, thanks so much. Nella Rich Richardson, Chief Economist at Redfin. And folks, that is Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Tyler Matheson. Thanks for watching. And I'm Sue Herrera. Have a great evening. We will see you right back here tomorrow.